Okay, this book, uh, Turn It Up, My Time Making Hit Records in the Glory Days of Rock Music by Tom Werman. Yep. This will be out on November the 21st. I will put a purchasing link just below this video. Uh, Tom, the first question I always ask people when it comes to an autobiography is why and why now? Uh, well, it's not really totally an autobiography. Mm -hmm. I feel that it's it's a little bit of a memoir. There's a little bit of autobiographical information in there, but it's also very, I think, very informative, and it it uh, memorializes and um, remembers and teaches about what how the record business worked in the '70s and '80s and what kind of music there was in the 70s and 80s and why it was why it's called classic yeah. and and why i feel that it was um the best creative musical period uh, uh, at least of the century yeah yeah uh, and and a lot of it uh has to do with the <coughs> so-called british invasion yeah we know with, the brits with, with in yeah in in some very small period of time beginning with the beatles in 64 mm -hmm. uh, you england generated about 25 or 30 influential musical acts where we could manage about 10 wow. in that same period and we had four times your population so something was going on in the uk you know which was which was really a great gift um and that you know that was responsible for most of the 70s and 80s great music and um i just love it and i wanted other people to know why i thought it was so good yeah why it's so good well all those bands you you mentioned i mean all of them were looking uh looking at sort of american rock and roll of the 50s and influenced by by that but there seemed to be a lull you know, Elvis got drafted. Um, Chuck Berry was in. Uh, Chuck Berry was doing time, and uh, right. Jerry Lee Lewis was doing his cousin, effectively. And Little Richard had found <laughs> God. Then there, there seemed to be this fallow period. I think we had the Beach Boys, didn't they? they were from sort of about sixty-two onwards. Beach Boys. Beach Boys were in there. You know, Hendrix was in there. Uh, uh, you know, there there were some. You know, Simon and Garfunkel, Dylan. But um, we were overwhelmed, yeah. uh, happily overwhelmed by by uh, the, the the British influx. And uh, you're right, Alvin Alvin Lee once said we were um, we were playing uh, or revisiting American music, and uh, they were calling it the British sound. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of reinterpreting the blues for white people. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. But um, uh, Joni Mitchell is another one I, I, I'm uh, a big fan of as well. But uh, so it's, it's, um, it's amazing how many uh, American artists all tell me that the that uh, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show in '64 was like a, a watershed moment for them. You know, it's uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and a few weeks after that, I I saw them in Carnegie Hall mm -hmm. um, and heard them perfectly really? because the Screaming Girls had mostly gone home to bed because th this was the late show around 10 o'clock. Yeah. There were two shows that evening for $7 and 50 cents, uh, row M on the aisle, mm -hmm. you know, um, I couldn't see, uh, it was my first rock and roll show. Yeah. And I was already, um, 19 mm -hmm. because I grew up in Boston and you mentioned Chuck Berry, there was a riot. Yeah. at a Chuck Berry show at the Boston Garden. And um, consequently, rock and roll shows were banned in Boston. Right. So right. I couldn't, I left Boston to go to college in New York. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was, that was my, uh, that was the whole schooling I had in, in, in rock, rock music. If I hadn't been in New York, I don't know what I would have been able to see. I saw the Stones first show and I saw the Beatles first show. I saw Tommy debuted in New York mm -hmm. at, at the Fillmore East. Um, but that was a loud all, one. All kinds of things. Um, Paige, uh, Paige, Plant, <clears throat> no, Paige Beck, and one other uh, played one night 
at one club. Um, it was just an, an amazing time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, interestingly, Frank Zappa said, uh, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. Uh, given what you say about the state of uh, music in the start of your book, about it being digitally produced and corrected, how healthy yeah. is rock and roll? How, how, I'm sorry? What? How, how healthy is rock and roll? Well, I think it's over. Uh, you know, for me, you can't, I can't take my pronouncements as, as, as gospel because I have not uh, admittedly sought out new music. There are very few guitars left. There are no obvious shredders, you know, um, like, uh, like Eddie Van Halen. Um, I just think that it was a um, a a period that ended. It began in, in the mid fifties and ended uh, around nineteen ninety. Um, for me, uh, probably ended around two thousand for everybody else. <coughs> That's it's when sound became equally important or more important than content. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in in music and. And as as I say in the book, um, you know, there's something about a song that has one snare hit mm -hmm. become all the snare hits. They're exactly the same. Yeah. You know, and and so almost everything is sampled once, and then duplicated where needed in in every song. And there's just something about it that wears out pretty quickly. Um, the, the the records we made, warts and all, uh, were human, and and some somehow they uh, you know they've lasted. I I still uh, I have a four hour playlist of most everything that I liked from that period, and uh, I use it in the gym, and I've used it for thirty or forty years, and the songs still inspire me. Yeah, yeah, still inspire me. They. Uh, a young friend of, of, of mine said, uh, well, you know, there is good music today. There really is. I'm sure there is. But he, I don't know where to find it. He uh, made a, a little playlist for me. And I played it in the gym. I liked it very much. I got I got to like it a lot uh, within a week or two. And then by the time two months had gone by, it, it wasn't working any magic at all. Um, it just wasn't inspiring me. And I think that's because it was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it seems to be, you seem to be echoing uh, uh, what Gene Simmons says, that rock is dead. Uh, he says there's no music industry anymore. You know, there's no music industry. There's not going to be another Beatles, another Who. It's all finished now. It's, uh, awesome. it's a grim prognosis. Yeah, that... There has to be, uh, you know, as uh, as Paul Simon once said, every generation throws a hero up the pop charts. Mm -hmm. And I think that the equivalent, the modern or the future equivalent of, of the Beatles will happen at some point. Uh, I don't think it'll um, it'll resonate with me or with us or with anyone uh Oh, who who lived through the seventies and eighties, yeah. but I think it will apparently. Uh, you know, I, I ask a lot of kids what they listen to. Uh, I had a couple of young young guys over here yesterday, uh, and I asked them what they listened to, and they said modern. You know, do you listen to yesterday's music or today? They said today, and they said what um, you know what acts did you produce? And I mentioned many of them and and they had heard of twisted sister right and, and that was it that was the, basically the extent of their knowledge about classic rock whereas my son <clears throat> uh, you know grew up he's he's a kind of an encyclopedia mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of music he works for warner records in in, in uh, la in a and r and he knows as as do many of his friends, knows everything about music from Elvis to now. Yeah. Really. Well, my daughter's uh, fourteen, and she's uh, she's listening to Queen and the Beatles and uh, Motley Crue. She likes uh, 
all these sort of yeah. bands really probably because uh, they're all the cds i've had on my own shelf maybe the curiosity has made i want to explore that music it's not a bad thing yeah. either right it's uh yeah <clears throat> interesting they are uh, they, they know we we uh, listened to some of our parents music yeah when i was growing up and started to listen to the radio in the 50s i listened to a little sinatra and um, I listened to a lot of folk artists. You know, I was fascinated with fretted instruments, uh, but I didn't listen to Benny Goodman. Yeah. And, you know, I did not listen to, nor did my friends listen to um, the music that their parents listened to when they were young. Yeah, yeah. These days, as you said, with your daughter, there you go. They they do. And, and you know, if I could have, if I could be snide for a minute, I, you know, I say, well, one of the reasons is that, you know, it's so much better than today's music. Yeah. And, and I channel my parents without question when, you know, cause my parents, all of, all of our parents used to say, you call that music, you know? And I once, I once sat my parents down when I was home, uh, for a vacation I, I i maybe i was in graduate school or I'm, I'm not sure when it was but i sat them down in the living room and i played them she's leaving home yeah by the beatles and and when it was over because they wouldn't they they would not tolerate rock and roll my mother wouldn't allow it within earshot and i had to always go in my room and close the door um my mother i said you can't deny that this is art and my mother looked at me and said, well, dear, we'll see if it stands the test of time. Uh-huh. And it's too bad she's not around to, to yeah. see that it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got to ask you, I'm, I'm curious, what was it like seeing Kiss way back in 74, 73? And, and uh, how disappointed were you that Epic passed on them? And of course, Rush as yeah. well as the band. Uh, uh, so Kiss, they must have been a, a pretty incendiary act to see then. Well, I only got to see them once, and that was in rehearsal as a three-piece. Okay. Uh, you know, because Gene and Paul in the studio in the band Wicked Lester were nothing like what they were in Kiss, what they are in Kiss. No. Um, you know, it was a, a little bit of performance art. Uh, I've never seen any band in whiteface uh, or, or in spandex or giant boots or, you know, and, uh, they, you know, they were very, very good. And I, you know, I, I didn't flip for them like I did for some other acts that I signed, but I did understand that their music was good. Mm-hmm. It would be very commercial for a lot of people, yeah. a lot of music listeners. And um, unfortunately, I, uh, with all of those bands, Skinner and Rush and Kiss, when my boss passed on them, I didn't have the <clears throat> clout in that, you know, in, at the label. Uh, uh, I'd only signed one hit and he didn't understand uh, rock and roll, really. Um, he, he was a smart guy. He, he understood a lot of music, but he didn't understand the, the, the rock music thing. And so it, it didn't happen. Um, interestingly enough, many years later, uh, when I was the head of A&R <coughs> Electric Records, mm-hmm. I, uh, I went to see, uh, this, this girl, downtown with uh with the uh, vice president uh, with the second in charge at electra who invited me uh and she was fabulous i mean really fabulous and um she's an african-american girl and sang kind of gospely stuff and 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 she was beautiful and yeah. and and I, I you know when it when when her little audition was over uh i just turned to to, to my the, you know the the vice president of the label and and i laughed because she was that good and we went back and told the head of the label you've yeah. got to go see this girl you must go see this girl she's great he went to see her a couple of weeks later and <coughs> his words were why should i sign 
someone who sounds like Chaka Khan when I just recently signed Chaka Khan, right. which which he had at Warner Brothers, and it was Whitney. Oh, right, really? Yeah. And, and you know, these things happen. People do pass on, you know, I, I remember the Who very kind of cruelly put a copy of a pass letter that one a and r guy uh, in london for some label had written them you know and they uh, apparently pete was pissed enough so, to to say well well i'll, I'll show this jerk uh, we're going to we're going to put his letter in every album yeah yeah, yeah live <laughs> yeah. at leeds yeah live at leeds right yeah. leeds. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> I suppose, uh, you know, I suppose there's always uh, stories of, of those those people that pass on bands like, you know, the Beatles and things like that. That must it must haunt them, I guess. But uh, um, one question I've got to ask you, I, I'm intrigued with what was wrong with Lou Futterman's mix of the first Ted Nugent album? And how disappointed were you not to be in, uh, involved with the mix of the, that famous live album he did? Uh, well, that album, it, it just didn't have it didn't have the the threat that ted had expressed uh, uh want, want he wanted he we talked at length about um you know the feel uh, of his music we did not i want to stress that we did not talk politics uh -huh. back then he, uh, uh, you know he and i are way way uh -huh. at, at the ends of that spectrum but um it, it was just bland and it wasn't, I don't think it was well mixed sonically. Um, you know, I can't remember precisely what I didn't like about it, but I definitely was disappointed and I didn't want it out because I thought uh, Ted was one of my last chances to secure tenure at Epic Records, you know, to 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 stay there and to hang my hat on something because, um, you know, I, I had been turned down on all these other these other bands. And, and and so I, I I just went to my boss and I said, you've got to please give me, um, you know, give me money to uh, here's my cat um, to remix this record. And I remixed the record and Ted um, thought it was great. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got to pick this little guy up. What's that? My cat. Oh, OK. <coughs> making, making noise but when you were involved with the um um the ted nugent album uh weekend warriors did that did that uh, mean that you you weren't available for the cheap trick album live at the budokan right mm -hmm. uh it was too bad I, I you know i i i could have bailed yeah but at that time i was really you know the main guy uh lou was doing um kind of producing vocals yeah you know and um and i was I, I was pretty much doing the rest and i couldn't walk out i thought uh you know i had a responsibility um that was the album that i was least excited about and it was the last one i did with ted but yeah i mean how uh, how thrilled were you that cheap tricks album in color was named uh, rolling stone Al album of the year and uh, how disappointed were you that the band was saying they weren't happy about it later on in the press? Right. Well, you know, it happens with a lot of bands. Um, there are very few. I, I, I've rarely read any rave reviews from a band about the guy who produced their record 20 years ago. Um, very few people, uh, artists have said, um, man, he did a great job with us. We were so pleased. Um, it's not unusual for for them to complain, and and the deal is that uh, just sonically, I mean, you've got twenty years or thirty years of technological advances, yeah. and and everything sounds better and harder and wompier than than it did then. Um, <coughs> much more bottom, much more thump. Yeah, uh, I didn't. Of course, I I you know I didn't enjoy it, but. But um, I don't know, there's there's uh, at some point in the book, I say uh, it's really unfortunate that uh, they love you when, you know, when their albums are selling, when it's just been released, when it's a hit, when it sells millions of records. 
Um, and then um, 20 years later, uh, you know, they get angry because uh, you apparently destroyed their multi-platinum records. Right. It's 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 just hard to figure. Um, you struggle with that. Yeah. I, I I don't think I'm alone uh, as a producer in that regard. Yeah. Um. What did you do to upset D. Snyder? What did I do to D. Snyder? What did you do to upset D. Snyder? Oh yeah, <laughs> I existed. Oh, okay. You know, uh, uh, he he was uh, one person uh, for the entire project. He approved the mix. They all, I, I had every band approve mixes in order to safeguard, you know, to, to, to protect my <laughs> my reputation and to avoid uh, exactly what happened years later. But with D. Snyder, it was a day later. I mean, he walked out of the studio and started trash talking me, you know, in a way that nobody ever has. And I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I had no idea what was going on. Uh, eventually, I, I kind of assumed that because he had put so much work into his band for so many years and they hadn't really done anything significant in the American market mm -hmm. that he uh, did not want to share credit for this uh, big hit record. Yeah. You know, and this made their lives. This, this, this made the band's life uh you know and he he eviscerated me for suggesting that they do a saxon song yeah that they cover a song and they said and he he was outraged at that he said, you know we toured with saxon we 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 don't want to cover a song we, we know that song when that you know he was very angry that i did that i thought more of a saxon song than i did if we're not going to take it yeah um, you know, and then what did he do? The next record, they they used uh, Dieter Dirks to produce it, and their first single was "Leader of the Pack." Uh -huh. You know, with, you know, this kind of a a decent pop song from from the early '60s, I guess. It was a cover, and you know, the hypocrisy was pretty outstanding. I don't know. I just. You know, at this point, um, I don't care very much, um, you know, what he says. He said it all. He said in a in a book of his, um, I think the, the exact quote is, uh, I think that Tom Worman personally destroyed our album. And then, and he went on. I, I, in the book, I quote him as uh, saying in, in, in several interviews how great the album was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't get it yeah yeah it seems strange um i'm interested to ask you as, as a producer what, what's your opinion of uh, phil Spector? well he was great yeah but he was nuts <laughs> yes. I, I don't think one one thing had to do with the other you know i don't think you have to be uh you know a crazy gun nut he brought a, he brought a gun to the studio yeah that's right who's gonna who's gonna attack him in the recording studio it's one of the safest places in the world sure and you just can't get in um i don't know but he sure was good i mean he you know he had a he had a formula he mm -hmm. and he used it and we loved it yeah 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 you know, so he was great uh, you know a lot of producers are pretty eccentric mm -hmm. But I would say he takes the prize for eccentricity. I guess he does, yeah. Um, given the um, uh, given the condition of rock in the in the nineteen eighties, do you think grunge was something that had to happen? Had to happen. Well, yeah. You know, even I started to be a little concerned about this certain sameness of the um procedure that i would take yeah. to make a record and, and and which resulted in a lot of records sounding having the sound that was pretty much the same you know among the uh, hair bands in la um 
the whole warrant, rat, skid row, motley crew, um, just just a, you know, uh, it, it was time for a change. And um, as I, as I say, you know, in the book, I strove for perfection. Right. Um, I wanted everything to be neat in time, in tune, um, because that was how I figured you could uh, make a powerful uh, song, make, make a, have a powerful production. Yeah. And eventually not more than 10 years later, bands avoided perfection like the plague. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, mistakes and clams and imperfection were um, kind of uh, critical to the success of any street band, any, you know, any grunge band. With, um, uh, with grunge embracing imperfection, uh, yeah, say. Uh, is that not really just hearkening back to the the punk era of the late seventies, in that sort of attitude? I guess so. I I mean, for me, the, I, I I can't really define the difference between punk and grunge. I guess grunge is more Seattle. Yeah, you know, um, uh, punk is yeah is 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 kind of uh, rebelling uh, against corporate rock. Yeah, um, the grunge guys uh, were the the Seattle sound was a little more musical and a little more professional and a little more uh, concerned yeah. with uh, with correct music, with you know with with things like pitch and and tempo and and things like that and things like that. Uh, this I think what distinguished grunge from punk was was the song, the lyrics, the you know, they were thoughtful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I've got one last question for you. Um, how would you describe working with Motley Crue? And why did Nicky Six uh, dismiss your work with the band in his heroin diaries? I do not know. Again, uh, I, you know, I'm a little surprised that uh, people could or would take that as as fact um, if it was written uh, about somebody who was under the influence of heroin. Sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't really uh, trust that over a, a straight author. But um, again, I you know I I don't know. It's an ego thing. Uh, a lot of it was fiction. Um, the, there was a part in there uh, where he could claim that he produced all of Vince's vocals right. and he produced none of Vince's vocals. And, and uh, you know, he would, he would tell Vince how to sing. You know, he would say, no, it goes like this. But I, <laughs> I was the one who, who uh, you know, put together the composite tracks and fixed this and, fixed that and punched in and punched out and told him what to sing again and how to sing along. And, um, and, you know, I, I just think that, um, and, you know, I collaborated. Yeah. Produce, producers don't have that much authority. They suggest things, you know, the band hires you. Yeah. They, they really, it comes out of their album budget. Your, your fee comes out of their album budget. If they hire you, they can fire you. Yeah. And 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 so why did he? Why did they agree to having me do three albums over like four years? Um, instead of saying we don't like this, uh, we we don't like this now. Later, it's always later that they come up with these complaints. But the complaints in Nikki's case were way out of line they 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 were fictional a lot fictitious a lot of them and uh you know his book was reviewed in the sunday new york times book review which is it uh -huh. it's in it. and i said wow how, how did that happen and and so i read the book and then i wrote a letter to the to the book review yeah and I said sorry you know this this is, i was there and much of this is not true, and and that started our war. Okay. Okay. You know, eventually, he called me and and apologized 
for being difficult, but I determined that that was the make amends part of the 12 step program. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I've got to ask you, which do you think is the best? Which is, what do you think is the better album, Sergeant Pepper or Pet Sounds? The best album? Better album, Sergeant Pepper or Pet Sounds? Oh, Sergeant Pepper or Pet Sounds? Well, you know, I, I think Sergeant Pepper. Everyone loves Pet Sounds. I like Smiley Smile. Yeah, yeah. Which, which had, a, I think, uh, some common uh, songs. Um, I think it was brilliant, and it's very, it's not well known. Sergeant Pepper, you know, I mean, almost anything the Beatles did was in a class of its own, and and uh, you know, especially, uh, oh, I, I mean, everything about it. Like the Beatles, the, the, they were they were just unique, special, ridiculously. Uh, I mean. As 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 I said, I think I said in the book, I I simply can't say enough about the Beatles. I don't know if anyone can, but as far as I'm concerned, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, I'll just plug the book once more. Uh, this is uh, Turn It Up, My Time Making Hit Records in the Glory Days of Rock and Roll by Tom Werman. This will be available on the 21st of November. There is a purchasing link just below this video. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my questions and have this general chat about a bygone age, if you if you will. Yes, it is. Uh, thank you very much for your questions and for promoting the book.